Hello, welcome to the Ink Games podcast. Uh, we've been uh, on a bit of a hiatus. You might have missed us, but it's okay. All charges have been dropped now, so uh, we're back. Uh, my name is Peter Parrish. I'm joined by uh, a couple of uh, gaming chums here in the podcast. Uh, that's what I'm going to go with this week, gaming chums. Um, one of them is Paul Junger, who I believe we're keeping from some important television uh, events. Hey, don't mess with my television. Seriously, it's George's miniature <laughs> homes tonight, or whatever it is, George's small houses. <laughs> I don't even know what this is. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm not even in the right continent for <laughs> knowing what this program is. So, uh, sounds intriguing, though. Tell me more about George's miniature homes, Paul. Uh, the video he's... game industry can wait. <laughs> yeah, he's got homes, and they're small, and he wanders around them going, this is amazing, it's small. There you go. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, also here... Uh, Live and loud from the Isle of Man is uh, Tim McDonald. Hello. Hi. No, nothing it's, else it's to like say. I, I'm I'm not watching George's miniature homes. <laughs> <laughs> what is that even a TV show? So uh, is it? It sounds like a car. Is it a cartoon, or is it an no, actual? No, no, no guy? it's an a factual thing. I guess it goes around caravans and stuff, and instead of blowing them up, just sort of goes they're nice. But um, uh, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Exciting stuff. <laughs> Enough on that. Maybe we can get some sponsorship out. <laughs> no. um, all right. So a uh, bit of a change to the previous format. Although we are going back to the format that the podcast had way, way back in the day. So if you've been sticking with us for a very long time, then uh, you might recognise this. Tim's confused already. But what it basically means is we're going to start <laughs> start with talking about a bit of news that's been swirling around the uh, video game world this week um, and for me that's mostly uh, centered on Kickstarter stuff to be quite honest with you there's been an awful lot of Kickstarter related projects uh, being launched uh, ones reaching conclusions, others being cancelled uh, all sorts of malarkey like that um, I'll say well let's start with one that Tim actually mentioned previously which was the the one for an old old school RPG. Tim, stop looking confused when I mention things that, that you know about. I, I haven't done one of these podcast things in ages. I don't know what's going on. Neither have I. Neither have I. It's fine though. Um, yeah, anyway, it's the uh, the Tom Hall and Brenda Braithwaite uh, old school RPG, which um, launched on Kickstarter a couple of weeks back and was trying to raise about a million, million or so um, and they uh, over the weekend actually just cancelled it. Um, they had about 250,000 um, pledged already but they I guess felt that their pitch wasn't really strong enough and, and that they were going to uh, regroup and uh, come back with I guess a, yeah, a, better, a better pitch. So uh, how, did, how, did you, how do you feel about that Tim? that whole situation. <laughs> um, sad, surprised and amused in that order. Um, <laughs> sad because it actually looked quite interesting um, mm. and and frankly uh, Brenda Braithwaite is worthy of quite a lot of respect because she did play testing on Wizardry 4 which is one of the hardest games ever made. Um, surprised because I think this is the first time I've actually seen someone cancel a Kickstarter project prior to um, prior to the actual end of the backing yeah. period. Um, I haven't seen that happen before and amused because much as they say they've cancelled it, you do appear to still be able to back it if you want to. Um, as far as I can <laughs> really? tell it's different right now. Um, so, so yeah. Is there, no, is there no actual method of of cancelling your Kickstarter? Is, is it something to do with, with the site itself then that you can't actually wrap it up before it Concludes. Um, uh, having not kickstarted a game yet, I don't know. Um, <laughs> God forbid that ever happens. <laughs> Tim's, JRPG, game like? Tim's, Tim's JRPG bonanza pack. <laughs> <laughs> I am absolutely doing this someday. I'll, I'll uh, give you some money, Tim. I'll give you twenty dollars for that. <laughs> oh, no. That's quite impressive. You have to pay me twenty dollars, Tim. It's not a kickstart. It's the reverse of Kickstarter. In fact, I'm going to launch that. <laughs> Pay me not to do it. It's going to be throw ender. No, that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of with you, Tim, in that I was surprised that. Um, I mean, I thought that I thought this was going to make its 
make its money essentially um i uh, certainly felt that yeah the the two personalities involved were big enough and sort of known enough um in their respective fields to to generate enough interest and and drive enough interest for the project but you may well, disagree am, am i am i i'm romero was involved in this wasn't he he, um, in a way, yes, the, it's his company, uh, Loot Drop, that they were sort of doing it through. I mean, I don't think he was going to work on the game as such. I'm <laughs> Daikatana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lest we never forget. The one Superfly thing... Superfly Johnson, rest in peace. Before we, before we start talking about Daikatana, the one thing <laughs> that gets me about this is the fact that Tom Hall is doing a Kickstarter and it's not an Acronox 2. Considering that the cliffhanger that game ended on, where the hell is the second one? We, we, we need resolution. The there, <laughs> no, I no, didn't. No, I said it's cliffhanger. Well, That's no. not a spoiler. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I was just trying and to get you in trouble. Surely, um, surely there's got to be some sort of statute of limitations for these things. <laughs> How old is Anachronox now? No. Uh, it's 2001, something like that. As well, it's more than ten years, I think. So yeah, if you yeah, it, it, it was. If you haven't played that, and you're you're thinking, well, I'll get round to it soon. Then <laughs> that's like me, Tim. I'm I'm slow with getting around to some of these games. <laughs> um, do you do you think that that's? I oh, forget. It, I'm not even going to ask. <laughs> oh, can we digress? Carry on, Peter. We do. We do. Uh, so I guess mo moving on from that particular Kickstarter, there was one. Uh, that finished fairly recently that was extremely successful and in fact broke the uh, current record for the amount of money raised through a Kickstarter previously, or for a video game Kickstarter anyway, previously held by the Double Fine Adventure um, and that was Obsidian's Project Eternity which uh, came out at about four million, four million dollars raised, and a little bit more I think when they added PayPal stuff on top of that, but uh, basically four million dollars um, and Full disclosure, that is one that I gave $20 to, so uh, oh, <laughs> if oh I'm enthusiastic. <laughs> I know. I, this, this, uh, this is a, hang on, I've just, just realised something. I know that you adore Obsidian, uh, and you yes. gave them $20, and you, you did just verbally pledge $20 to me for my game. Does that mean you hold me in as high esteem as Obsidian <laughs> when it comes to games? Um, <laughs> It may appear that way to the lay viewer, <laughs> <laughs> but no. Um, I, I, I just think I just think your game would be funny, Tim. So thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a compliment, assuming that I was intending to do a comedy game. Um, because I, I should you. also point out, I, I also offered money to Obsidian for this one. So I feel like if I know someone personally and they start a Kickstarter for a video game, I'm, I'm probably going to donate them some money. It's a bit. It's a bit churlish not to, isn't it, <laughs> really? Because <laughs> what does that really say about your friendship? <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, digressing again, back to Project Eternity, which, uh, well, it's pretty early in, in construction, but I'm as excited for it as I was when it was announced, pretty much, because it is... Uh, it's Obsidian, the people behind uh, Fallout New Vegas and Knights of the Old Republic 2 and uh, a little game called Alpha Protocol, which I quite like. Um, and they have basically Chris Avalone on board, Josh Sawyer, Tim Kane, who was previously at Troika, you know, Vampire the Masquerade and Arcanum and stuff like that, um, saying we're going to make an RPG, um, which was pretty, <laughs> pretty much enough to uh, sell me on it. Uh, how about you, Tim? Is that... Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it for me as well, really. Um, I've got a lot of time for Obsidian and a lot of respect for them. Um, and frankly, any game that they're going to make is one that, even if it does turn out to be buggy, even if it does turn out to be a train wreck, uh, I suspect that there will be something in there that will be innovative and worth looking at. So I suspect that in terms of the reasoning why I've put my money in, I don't think I'm going to be particularly disappointed. Um, but with a bit of luck, it will actually turn out to be a really good game, and they've certainly got the talent and uh, and the pedigree for it. Yeah, that's one to look out for in about 2014, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that one's due out. But, uh, Paul, I know you were you were pretty into the uh, Star Citizen that Chris Roberts is uh, is behind. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm quite excited about that. Mainly because I don't think there's enough um, sort of space type games around these days. I think the last one I seriously played was um, Star Lancer, um, which mm. I think actually was from the same universe. It was just not done by him. I could be wrong. I think I'm right. Um, but yeah, that that I really loved that, um, and it was all seemed all too short and all over too quickly. And yeah, I, I could really just do do with another one. I do like them. So he's um, he, to begin with, he had he was taking pledges and, and sort of crowdfunding through his own site or rather the official site for the game, um, which, as you say, is a sort of um, a space combat sim, um, a sort of pseudo MMO. Like it's going to have a persistent universe, um, but you can also kind of have your own private servers or something like that. I haven't quite got to the bottom of how it <laughs> is going to work in. Uh, in its entirety, but uh, and then he also he was, he was taking money through through his site, but then also launched a Kickstarter this week. Um, I, think, I think the servers apparently apparently the servers just buckled under the weight. Of, I mean that's that's probably PR spin. Probably didn't buckle at all, but it makes everyone go, oh look how exciting this is! So we must go and give give them all our money. Um, but I think for me what I find quite interesting about it is that he, he's basically come out and said look, you know, we need to start pushing uh, the technology we need to start pushing what PC gamers can get out of their rigs, we really want to make this a game that shows off you know, the latest um, graphics capabilities, and I really like that I like things that really try and push especially on the PC platform um, push things forward, um, and that, that to me is quite exciting do you think some of the games of late have been a bit held back uh, by the fact that the 360 and PS3 are technology from, what was it, like eight years eight years yeah. now? I think the problem is now, I mean, you, you see it less so um, now where they actually put like a PC version of the same game out. Um, after yeah. I think so many PC gamers are just getting pissed off um, with, you know, just the usual port mentality and just, it's not pushing things. Um, the PC can just really do so much more, and I kind of always felt a little bit shortchanged if I, you know, I'd bought a game and I found that it, it was a pretty much a console port. And the dead giveaway is the bloody menu system for Christ's sake. It's the first thing you go in. It's all clunky, you know, <laughs> up down, uh, you know. And it sounds really stupid, but you can just tell straight away, and you're thinking, oh God, what have I bought into here? It, it is always disappointing when you go to the graphics options and it's got resolution. That's it, <laughs> basically. Pixels. Yeah, um, uh, there's no, there's no anti-aliasing. There's no, you know, texture quality. And, uh, none of the options that you uh, would generally be used to from a, from a PC game, and it's always disappointing because one of the great things about PCs is the sort of uh, the, the tweaking that you can do with your machine to uh, find the right balance between frame rates and uh, good looks that you're that you're looking for. Yeah. So that is always. I, I think so. I think. Also, the fact that the, the next gen stuff, um, and everyone was kind of expecting it at least to be announced this year, uh, maybe it'd been out for Christmas this year again, it's been pushed back. So, yeah, it's another year goes by um, where you know things are kind of stuck um, in, in the same rut. So, I, I'm glad that things are starting to push forwards on the PC from my point of view as a PC gamer. I, I think it's, um, it's only good. I mean, there is a possibility, of course, that the uh the Star Citizen game might end up coming out in conjunction with with new consoles, and that it won't be out for uh, for a while. I would imagine it's it's uh, he's got yeah. He's I, got yeah I, I think it's going to be a long way off, um, yeah. but it's probably a good time to do it. There's not a hell of a lot of, of this, that sort of stuff around. Um, things kind of go in cycles, you know, um, where we'll get one sort of type of game, and then you'll get mm. another. Then it'll be disappear for a while. And then someone will come up with something else. Although I, I have noticed there's a lot of sort of spacey type stuff appearing on Kickstarter. Um, there are, yeah. There was another one, Strike Suit Zero. Um, there's another one that looked uh, less less of an MMO type thing and more of a, a single player X Wing type campaigns thing. Um, but that looked, that looked pretty so solid. Basically, as well. if you're making a space game or an RPG, you go on Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> if you're making, but, if you're making you know, a racing but, game, then I'd just don't bother. But then the um, but then the Tom Hall, Brenda Braithwaite thing was an RPG, and they uh, they decided to wrap it up. So uh, 
Yeah, well, I think, I think they wrapped it up because they had no um, vision of what it... It was just really sketchy. There was no vision about what they were trying to do. And they didn't explain it well. It's, it's interesting, though, because I... I mean, I didn't feel that the Obsidian one really had a huge amount more behind it. Um, I was prepared to to go for it because I trust the company behind it, and you know, I I like the previous work of the of the people who who were going to be involved. But I mean, they basically just said, "You remember those Infinity Engine RPGs from yesteryear? We're going to do one of those." I mean, that's pretty much all they had to begin with. Um, so. I- I think the part of the reason why they closed it down as well was the fact that at this stage they were um, I think right now it's about 10 days away from closing as in the actual end of the kickstarting period and they weren't even a quarter of the way through what they wanted in terms of funding Yeah, uh, which does make me wonder if at that point rather than actually having a failed kickstarter they just thought alright we'll close it down mm-hmm. we'll sort things out we'll look at all of this and we'll come back and try again later Um Kind of yeah. as a PR thing to some extent. T- time, uh, timing could be bad as well. You know, there's a lot of people pumping money into Kickstarter. Obviously, you mentioned the um, Obsidian project. I mean, mm. it, it, there's a lot of mumblings of Kickstarter burnout. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, somebody may support one or two projects, but they're not going to support four or five. Um, so, Kickstarter burnout could be happening. I, I don't believe it myself, but. Um, this could be the first sign of maybe people not jumping in when there's so many types of the same things appearing on Kickstarter all in a very very close succession. Mm. I mean, along those lines, how do you, for either of you, what do you think about sort of um, such established developers using Kickstarter? Because obviously uh, Obsidian has pulled in a lot of money. Um, some of that might have Previously, would have gone to smaller projects. Possibly, could is is there a is there a possibility that uh, I mean I know that, that there's no guarantees that the people who donated to Project Eternity were going to donate to other Kickstarters. But is there a possibility that the established names are going to come in, get all the attention, rake in the money, and kind of be to the detriment of smaller projects, which I suspect I th- was the intent of Kickstarter to begin with. I, th- I think it possibly could, but I can understand why people are doing it. I think people are so pissed mm. off with publishers and losing cuts and so on. And, and you know, it makes sense. It's self-publishing. And if you've got the talent yeah. there and you can get the funding in, then why the hell not? Um, I, I yeah, I... Go on, Tim. You're desperate. Go on. I can see you're gagging. Desperate. I said two words and then pointed at you when I realised you were still talking. It's the way you were licking your lips. <laughs> I, I, I think it's kind of a yes and no thing um, I mean as, as Paul said I can totally understand why they're doing it um, but I do also think that there are only certain types of projects that are going to work well on Kickstarter I can't imagine people trying to do a modern day military first person shooter on Kickstarter I don't think that would do all that well because it's such a saturated market in the sort of typical commercial world anyway. Um, in this case, it seems to be more, yeah. as Paul said, projects that we haven't seen for a while, um, things like space games yeah. and uh, niche old-school RPGs. They're the sort of thing we haven't seen in a while, and this is a possibility to actually get some more of them, um, which people are jumping at. So I, I think it's kind of a, a combination of the two, really. But I think also it, may, it lets people, the, the developers themselves, see if the project that they're thinking about is viable. Um, they're not having to, you know, sign a contract um, with, say, a, a publisher. They don't. They won't have. They'll have their own target set for the progress of the development. Um, and I think that is the attraction of it. I think people will get. Fa- How many games have we seen that have come out that effectively are just pushed out the door because they've got publishing pressure? Um, you know, they can turn around to their fan base, the people, the contributors, and actually just turn around and say, "Look, this is going to take two months longer," um, and they're not. People ain't going to complain. Well, some might, there but is. I think that would probably be unfair. Yeah, but they're not going to get their money back, are they? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I mean, they're, they're, funny you should mention that to some extent. I was just going to say, what do you guys think about the, the Kickstarter haunts that actually did hit trouble um, within the last I, week? I, I, think, um, I, I think that's um, exceptional circumstances, basically, where it looks like something's overrun and people have just... 
they've had enough and they've burnt out on it and they just don't really want to do it anymore and have moved on. Um, well, from what I can gather with that one, um, just as a, as a bit of background for everyone listening as well, this was a Kickstarter, uh, a fairly early one if I remember rightly, uh, and it was supposed to be out now. Uh, essentially, it was a sort of a turn-based strategy game set in a haunted mansion. Um, and what happened was that um, the game is programmed in Go, if I remember rightly, which That's is a right. fairly esoteric right. programming language. Uh, they had two programmers, both of whom were essentially on loan for a period of one year, uh, and so they've both left now to go back to their other jobs. Um, and so they're left with a game which is basically finished except it's quite buggy um, but they've got no one to program it and because it's written in such a, uh, an unusual programming language there aren't that many people that can actually help them code and fix it um, I think that from that point of view it's just bad planning in a way um, it's, I think it's inevitable and it sounded like it was a small team as well so when you have a small team and then two people suddenly people. leave you're in trouble I, I do think it's I think it's kind of heartening though that uh, after this they basically said that they would obviously refund money to anyone who was unhappy. Although they yeah. did also mention that they were planning on getting it finished, uh, regardless, it was just going to take longer. Uh, and I think only two people requested their money back um, out of everyone who backed it so far, at least, um, which I think is is quite heartening because Kickstarter's terms on this basically say that you are entitled to your money back if they don't deliver. But you know. Kickstarter hope that um, this would only be used, you would only ask for your money back if uh, it doesn't look like the people used your money in good faith, as in if they actually took your money and then pissed off to an island somewhere. Um, yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's kind of a good thing that this was the first to fail, horrible as that sounds, because this is one which wasn't a huge major project collapsing due to inefficient use of money or anything like that or a scam. Uh, this is one that was in good faith and I think that it's probably the best sort of project to have had these problems, particularly as they do seem to intend to still finish it. Um, mm -hmm. It's just delayed more than anything. It's not as damaging to people's perception of Kickstarter as a trustworthy process as it could have been. I, I think I think, um, I think Kickstarter is is good for the industry in, in the fact that it is like people take a few more gambles um, we are seeing things that are maybe slightly a bit more innovative, um, and I think the industry needs that. I think we've kind of got to the stage where um, we're just getting inundated with, as you quite rightly said, first-person shooters and you know um, MMOs that are all the same, and and it's just it's nice to see. I mean, I know that Peter's had his hands in a few of the sort of weirder titles. Um, last, last I like having my hands in weird things. Yeah, I well. know you do. I know you do, um, and obviously. I think it's interesting. I think this Project Gorgon as well, which is the um, this MMO that they're doing, um, effectively, that's in an old school style. In other words, you're not going to be handheld all the way through it. Is an interesting idea as well because in the advert since the days of WoW, everything that we see now is so dumbed down that um, people aren't being tasked too much to use their brains as far as an MMO is concerned. Tim, you winced. Is that going to be? Um, I'm just going to. Duck in with a question first. Is that are they aiming to go sort of Ultima Online style, where where it's kind of uh, anything goes to a degree? You know, like if someone owns owns some property, you can come in and kill them and steal <laughs> yeah. it. I think that I think the key. Of... I think the key here. I think one of their key goals is exploration. You know, one of the things that really hacks <laughs> me off about a lot of games is the fact that you you're shown exactly where to go all the time. You know, there's a map of a flashing dot because that's what you get when you go down the Ordnance Survey and you ask for a map. Um, there's a big flashing dot on it and where you're going to go. So I, I think um, the key here is exploration, but trying to add other other ideas and innovative ideas. Like one of the things that they've mentioned, obviously, is being able to drop items and anyone can come along and pick them up. You know, it's mm. just silly things like that that are so simple, but it could could just add something to the gameplay. Uh, that's like pre, uh, that's like pre-alpha stage now, so it's like really, really early on. Yeah. Did, did, did I ever tell you guys since you mentioned Ultima Online? Did I ever tell you my my story about my experience with Ultima Online, where I'd I'd played it for about two days, um, and I was just wandering around, and I wandered into a, a church or a chapel, and there was a, an in-game wedding going on uh, between okay. players, and I wandered in there with a, the friend that I was playing with. Uh, and as I was on 56k modem, someone picked up the phone 
uh, and disconnected me. And when I signed back in, everyone was screaming at me to sit down because they wanted to start the wedding. <laughs> uh, at which point, I tried to sit down. I accidentally <laughs> hurled a fireball and killed the bride. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and, and then I was chased halfway across the countryside by angry guests. Brilliant. Um, See, that, was, is, was, that is the kind of emergent <laughs> gameplay that you need from an MMO. That's, that's really like what someone... was... That's what was promised by the, the bold new dawn of MMOs, you know, and then it, as you say, it kind of went down this route where it's a, it's, it's a lot of uh, pre-guided stuff, I, I find, a lot of the time. I was going to ask, um, off the topic of MMOs, but on topic of Kickstarter, do you think that Kickstarter is kind of a logical extension of what we've seen then? Because, I mean, we were just talking then about how Kickstarter is kind of giving potential to all sorts of game genres and styles that we haven't seen in years. Um and this is exactly the sort of thing we were saying about the PC indie markets um, a couple of years ago, in that uh, it was it was giving bedroom coders another chance with with the internet. You could make a game, whatever sort of game you wanted, and get it out there to the public. Do you think this is kind of a logical extension? This is sort of moving it more uh, towards a business perspective for said bedroom coders, or what? I, I think from t talking to some people that have been in Kickstarter projects, you know, there's a few of them that actually have people working on the titles that are working remotely so you know they may have their art team maybe in Spain or you know and so on it is uh, bringing people together that necessarily can't geographically be together but have the same sort of vision it's that that in itself is quite interesting and it well it's not the bedroom coder um, scenario exactly it is a similar sort of thing where it's bringing like-minded people together I think it's just incredibly useful as well to have an outlet where you can raise um, a small amount of capital for, for yeah. a game, you know, and, and therefore maybe expand uh, the scope of, of what you were hoping to do. Because previously, if you were just um, a, a team of two on their own or something, um, didn't feel like you had much access to, to additional funds, you'd probably have to scale down your game to quite a bit to some extent. Whereas now you can think, well, if we had like three thousand or five thousand or something, we could, um, you know, we could take it to this this other level. Um, I, mean, it's, it, I mean, it's incredibly it's stupid good. if you think about it. I mean, it's it's so simple. Effectively, mm. you just you're basically saying to people, "We've got this thing. Do you like it? Pay us to make us do it." I mean, it's just yeah. so it's so simple. If you look at, yeah. for example, Path of Exile, you know, that's raised one point uh, one four million now, and they've had an ongoing beta what for like over a year. And it's just about to go into open beat in December, but again, they've had a product that the people have been be able to play, and they've watched the thing yeah. actually develop as they've gone along. They've implemented suggestions before the thing has actually, for want of better words, gone gold, um, and you know they've raised all that money in the in the in the, in the process. So they've been allowed to create a game that they want to create. They've allowed to get ideas from people. They've had the funding to keep the project going. Um, it just makes absolute sense. Certainly does. So Kickstarter, big thumbs up from us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that was my pen there as well. Double thumbs up with a pen. Um, okay, so moving on from the from the world of Kickstarter to uh, let's have a little chat about what we've what we've been playing recently. Um, Paul, have you been playing anything? Can I, uh, can I start? Okay, uh, where do I start? <laughs> where do I start? What have I been playing? It's been a while, so we can we can go back a few <laughs> weeks. Okay, well, obviously, uh, yeah, obviously, there's Torchlight Two, which I've obviously got stuck into. Um, mm. uh, what else have I been playing? I have been playing other things. Oh, um, XCOM, I've been playing a bit of that, but very little. I didn't want to get too engrossed in that, which is just um, Tim's Tim's nodding. Tim's, as we say in the trade, a bulb in hand at the at the, at the <laughs> mention of um, XCOM. There, um, so there are two things that I've had a look at. Mm. I tell you what, I. I if for the brief amount of time that I've played in XCOM, because I haven't had a lot of time the last uh, few weeks, um, I love oh. it, actually. I really can't say any more than that. I really think they've done a good job on it. And I can't... It's been so long since the original XCOM, um, and I can kind of remember the shitty graphics. And um, Well, they weren't <laughs> shit at the time, but they're shit Hey, now, now. come on. <laughs> um, the, do, you, do you remember the god-awful interface? Uh, yeah, but th this is what, what I love You're about right. this, is the fact that they've just captured... Um, the whole essence of what the original game was about um, for me 
and I, I really, I, I just really like it. And I, I'm, I'm going back to Torchlight too. I've, I kind of yep. really enjoyed that, but I kind of disengaged from the world a little bit with that. Um, I find that as I've been going through it, um, and kind of turned off a little bit by the game world. I don't know. Maybe it's just because of the act that I was in. Um, but I, what I love about Torchlight 2 is the gameplay, I think it's brilliant. I've gone back to Diablo 3 since start playing Torchlight 2 and I'm just going, oh man, this is so slow. You know, my character's like going half the speed across the screen, whereas Torchlight 2 is just like, you know, the, you're battering your way through it, you know, the whole way. And I really like that about that. that that's that's um, been super, super enjoyable. Um, and last night I put up um, Project Gorgon, which obviously is um, a little bit um, early because it's pre-alpha. Um, but it's interesting to see what they're doing even within the first five minutes um, of the game. There isn't a game client, it's all done on, on Unity, so it's in a browser at the moment. So um, even just seeing, you can kind of see where they're going with it, not filling you okay. in too much. You're just kind of dropped in and you're like, okay, what now? And there's like sort of little puzzles that are off the bat that make you think straight straight off the bat, not go out and kill 10 rats immediately and then just bring them back to <laughs> said bloke. Who has ordered why, you off to do that? Why is it? Why is it always ten rats? Which was the first game to do the ten rats thing? Because it's really stuck as a uh, synonym for for lazy questing. Um, was there ever a literal ten rats quest in any oh, game? I'm sure, sure there was. Probably was EverQuest, if anything, mm -hmm. um, or one of those. Oh. That was that was when I first encountered the phrase, anyway. I'd just like to say as well that very sad news this week was um, the death of Mike Singleton. Um, for uh, yeah, uh, Lord, yeah, Lords yeah. of Midnight, which I think we have to mention on here because Midwinter, uh, yeah, uh, Lords of Midnight, just like an absolute classic, absolute classic, love it. Still got the yeah. I've got the boxed version upstairs. That's impressive. Yeah, um, yeah. Should we talk about Lords of Midnight a little bit? That was um, quite a pretty innov innovative game for its time. It had a gigantic oh, man, the graphics game were awesome. <laughs> See, you you slagged off XCOM for having lousy graphics, but Lords of Midnight is. Uh, exactly. I wouldn't say the graphics are good, but certainly its its art style was using the tools it had available to it. The art style was solid, consistent, and and yeah, damn good for the for the time period. Sort of eighty, what was it, 82, 81 or something? I don't know. Tim, Tim, have you have you got magic hands or something? I just saw smoke coming out of your hands. The hell. <laughs> Are you a wizard, Tim? Are you doing some sort of Lords of Midnight wizardry tribute act? <laughs> oh, we've lost Tim's audio. He can't explain. Oh, no. Tim, Tim I can't your audio. You. Can you hear me now? Yeah. What was that? Yes. I I'm a wizard. I went to Hogwarts. <laughs> okay. in, in the intervening time, the last podcast and this one, I went to Hogwarts. Um, and, you know, I, I did all the classes, and I am now actually a, a full-fledged wizard. Is that why your hair is grown? Yes. <laughs> right, okay. I, I, to put, I want a pointy hat next I, week. I did only just shave off the beard as well. It was it was down to here. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Anyway, so that's what I've been playing um, this week. Um, and I guess Tim's now going to fill us in on what he's been playing. Fill me in, Tim. Well, I want to... Uh, uh, me. I want, I want to but carry on. I wanted to bring you in, Tim, on, on XCOM specifically, because you did the review for us at thinkgamers.com, um, and I enjoyed that review thoroughly. Thank you very much. Um, it was... Uh, you kind of took the line that it was not a straight remake of XCOM by any means, but I think perhaps, as Paul indicated, it was uh, capturing a lot of the essence of it. Which is pretty much exactly what I put in my review, I think. Um, yeah, See, I was. I'd read it. I didn't, I didn't read it. I never read your stuff, Tim. Thanks. Um, as long as you keep paying me, I don't care. Um, yeah, it's... I, I hesitate to use the term spiritual successor um, because that's abused so often. But I think in and this yet, case it's... it's you just something that you, Yes. I think in this case it's something that actually fits. It, I, I think that Firaxis kind of looked at what the original games made you feel and how yeah I, I think how they made you feel more than anything the sort of the the important aspects of gameplay um, and then they kind of updated them to the modern day like time units are gone um, mm. which thank god quite frankly um, 
So the uninitiated previously, you had each soldier would have in the region of probably around about 60 to 70 time units, and moving a space would take two, and then firing off a shot might take 31, and so you had to do a rudimentary maths puzzle every time you wanted mm. to move someone to work out if they were actually going to be in range, uh, and if they were going to have enough time units left to fire, and so on and so forth. You know, now you've just got two. Um, you can, one of them is always used for moving, and the other one you can either use to shoot, or to go into Overwatch, or to move even further. That's it. It's really, really simple. Um, but yeah, it kind of it keeps everything alive. It is still utterly bastard hard, mm. particularly uh, if you play on <laughs> classic difficulty or above. At which point it That's loses you're it all. That's because you're a real man, Tim. That's because you're a real man. <sighs> well, I've, I, I've, I haven't played it on anything other than Iron Man mode, um, oh, where you Iron can't. Man. That mode. sounds hard. What a badass. <laughs> <laughs> The real reason, though, Tim, yeah. is because you want to name the soldiers after your friends and then watch them die. Isn't that actually the truth of the matter? This is actually what I've been doing in my most recent game on Classic. I just want to see how long it'll take before I run out of people I know. Um, this is an insight. I, I, this is a quick, a quick insight into what happens when we're not on the podcast. Tim uses is, Skype to go, oh, yeah. hey, Peter, by the way, your, your guy in the game has just died. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you might like to know. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thanks. I, I, was, I was keeping you constantly updated. I told you when he got promoted. I told you when he did something useful, and I told you it's when true, he died. True. In yeah. fact, just before the podcast, I told you that he completely screwed up a mission for me and got everyone killed. Um, so when, when Tim, someone have, else... have I died yet? No, no, you haven't actually. You're you're still sat back at base. You haven't been on any missions yet. Yeah, that's what I'm um, here. Peter, when one person died, Peter panicked and immediately shot one of his squad mates with a shotgun and killed them. Excellent. Uh, which I think kind of puts it into perspective as to how much of a dick XCOM can be at times. Um, yeah, it's, it's, not the sort of game, it's not the sort of game you want to go into uh, with the mentality that you're going to do a perfect mission every time and you're not going to lose anyone. Because half of the fun of it is things going horribly wrong and then scrambling to fix yeah. them. Um, I remember, and playing I, remember, it all. I remember the first mission, I was just to get used to the controls, and I had this guy behind a sort of crate with a rocket launcher, and of course it gives you a little warning saying, don't do it, and I thought, oh, I thought, oh fuck it, I'm going to fire it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Madness ensued, and then I realised that oh, actually the game wasn't over, even though I'd just blown up my main guy, it didn't really matter. Yep. The game carries on up until, I think, nine nations withdraw from the, the project, at which point you're utterly screwed. Um, but yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it is, it, it's a game kind of about teetering constantly on the brink of disaster. Because every single mission has the potential of killing off your soldiers, your best soldiers that have been on 20 missions and leaving you with nothing but raw recruits who can't shoot straight. Um, and every mission you don't do will uh, cause terror levels to rise in other nations. And it's just a constant state of making decisions that are going to cause problems regardless of what happens um, and as such it's really exhausting to play um, but it is, it, it's just phenomenal um, it, it's a really really good game it's very very simple to play as opposed to its predecessors but hard to master I so guess would you, say, would you say then Tim that XCOM is game of the month this month um, for me, right now, probably, yeah, which is interesting considering that Dishonored came out as well. Um, and honestly, I don't think you can compare the two, um, because they are just so different and they are both really, really good games. But for me, yeah, if there was only one game this month that I uh, could choose, it, it would probably be XCOM, because I'm still playing it now, albeit very slowly, because it's... Uh, at the moment, I'm doing one mission at a time, and then I just cannot face another one, so I have to quit out and uh, regain my calm for a moment. Hmm. Yes, XCOM, very, very good. Buy it, people. I can come out with my wizard powers that I learned. He's talking, he's talking to me. He wants me to buy it. <laughs> when am I, I going to play it? I mean, I... Oh, I, 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 I I, I bought it and figured that um, if I did actually get a review code at some point, I would pass it on to you, because I really want you to play it, because I think that it's exactly your sort of game and you would adore it, but you don't buy yeah. games. <laughs> buy it! 
because I have enough. I have enough code coming in anyway that I, <laughs> that I have. I have plenty to play. I'm using Sorry. my wizard powers to make you buy it. I'll play it in about 2013, probably, based on uh, my usual schedule of playing games. <laughs> Fine. And I'll, give, I'll come back to you and be like, Tim, XCOM's really good. <laughs> and I'll say, I know, I told you to buy it years ago. I know, I know. Um, well, that said, I, if, if you actually don't buy it and if it does wind up on sale, I, I may get it for you as a Christmas present or something like that. I am, I am that... Oh, isn't that sweet? I am um, that inclined to make you play it. I will... I love you, Peter. <laughs> 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 I will be duty bound to play it then, because I, you know, I can't, exactly. I can't turn down that kind of gift. Um, yeah, we've no, talked for quite mean. a while, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna squeeze in a quick mention for something I played this week and previewed for the site. Uh, a little game called Cargo, Cargo Commander. Um, someone's emptying bottles outside my window, so that's why I got distracted. Is it, is it your cat? Um, uh, no, it's not my cat. It's someone else who lives in this building, doing their recycling. Anyway, Cargo Commander. Um, it's my little two-man indie team. Uh, it is... Kind of, I described it in my preview as kind of like Moon, the film Moon, uh, but the video game in the sense that you are a sort of a lone, a lone guy working on a... I guess essentially like a salvage rig in space. Um, your, your aim is to use a magnet to pull in um, big cargo containers and then essentially explore them in a kind of 2D platforming way. Um, and as you explore your way through the, through the containers that have kind of crunched in to your ship, um, eventually a wormhole shows up and starts disrupting them, so you have to leg it back out of those containers, possibly drifting through space with your limited air supply, and then uh, make it back to your little home base, um, collecting cargo as you go. Uh, and then every now and again you, you come across like a sector pass, which allows you to, to go into a new sector, um, and those sectors are generated I think based on some kind of algorithm, based on what name they're given, because you can basically travel, invent a sector yourself and travel to it. Um, so there were there were some quite obscene ones in the <laughs> in the preview code that, that I played, which is always good to see. Oh, example, um, give us an example. I it may be too filthy to air. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's we can say let let's say Chum Guzzler, except slightly different from that one. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Excellent. A very, po a very popular sector of space, I do believe. <laughs> Apparently, seen, it was. Yeah, I've seen many a Trek episode when Picard has gone into Chum Guzzler. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so anyway, every time you visit that sector or a different one, if you prefer, um, every time you visit that, it it will play out the same in the sense of how the types of cargo you get and so forth. That 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 come at you, um, but you can essentially invent, I, I guess, an infinite number of, of different types of them just by giving different names to the sectors. Uh, and then you have a, a kind of a, a score attack element to it as well for people trying to set different high scores on the sectors they've invented and explored. Um, you can also come across people's corpses uh, on, on their levels as well. If they've, if they've died at a certain point, you can uh, raid them for ammo and stuff. It looked, um, it, looked, it looked pretty fun, actually. Um, just like mm -hmm, the video. Yeah. So, did you? What, did, what were your thoughts? Did you enjoy it? Or I did enjoy it. Yeah, it was a. It's a pretty simple idea. Um, no, not massive. No huge amounts of depth to it, but it's. Uh, it had that kind of addictive quality, you know, where you think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to explore a few more cargo containers. I'm going to try this different sector, see what what cut bits of cargo I can get. And it also had a very sort of light but subtle story as well where every now and again you get emails from your wife and stuff going hey how's it going um, she's under the mis uh, misapprehension that you're working some kind of easy desk job rather than a extremely dangerous space salvage operation um, you also occasionally get drawings from your kid that, that that's quite amusing that go on your did wall they, did stuff. they have any amusing dirty drawings in as, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no they didn't have any <laughs> Just the name. I have sent you this ship that looks like a penis. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know which of the uh, people who got the preview code <laughs> were were giving giving the sector names uh, scandalous titles. Because <laughs> I want to congratulate them uh, for amusing me. But yeah, no, uh, pretty good. It's out in 
out in November, I believe, on uh, definitely on Steam, possibly also on Gamersgate and GOG and other good digital distribution channels. Read the preview if you want to know more about that. Um, do we know what's coming up on the site this week? I don't know what's coming up. Well, I do sort of. Um, I know that John was at an EA showcase, um, Christmas okay. showcase. Um, so he's got he's under strict embargo um, on some stuff. So look out for some EA stuff coming up. Um, next week we have a special um, Path of Exile week um, where we will be bringing you ah. um, exclusives um, from Act Three of the game, which was just revealed last week, um, and we'll have an interview with Chris Wilson, um, uh, CEO of Grinding Gear Games, um, and also a guy called um, Brother Laz, who um, uh, any Diablo 2 player will know who created the Media Excel mod. Um, but he was also hired by um, Grinding Gear Games to create the items for Path of Exile. Um, for, uh, okay. So um, he's going to be, uh, there'll be an interview with him, there'll be an interview with Chris, there'll be special um, information about um, Act 3, um, but about the monsters and the levels. Um, and then on next Friday, we'll be having a beta key giveaway to wrap up Path of Exile week. So it'll be a so week nice. long, um, um, long extravaganza. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, uh, Tim, uh, you're Tim. viewing Painkiller at the moment, I, I believe. Uh, I am Painkiller, uh, Hell and Damnation, I think it's called, which mm. I kind of want to call Blast and Tarnation instead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that review, that's embargoed, so I can't really talk about it, but that uh, right, will right. be up early next week, I think. I am waiting for am. GOG to uh, unlock Hotline Miami right. review code, because I will almost certainly take a look at that, because that looks good. Super violent and also quite frightening. So, <laughs> I don't know what time that, actually. Um, there will be lots oh. of other bits and pieces. I think there's another interview as well, which is that um, chivalry, yeah. chivalry, that medieval <laughs> thing that we were talking <laughs> about before the podcast. Chivalry, um, and and medieval warfare? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. the chap. That, there'll be an interview with the dev team as well coming in for that shortly. Um, and there are any other bits and pieces that pop in, really, as the week goes on. Yeah. So, um, All right. Well, we will be right. back. With the, the podcast is going to be regular this time, guys. Tim, yeah. I've I've got one thing to add. The one thing that we talked about before the podcast, which was to do with the last podcast that we did all those months ago. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> in case your memory is as awful as mine, um, last time we did the podcast, I wound up playing Simon the Sorcerer three D, which was very very bad. And Peter and I had a discussion about whether there had been any good games in the last twenty years with 3D <laughs> um, and we couldn't think of any um, and of then but you vetoed it that wasn't within the last 20 years that's yeah but that was there. when you made up that rule <laughs> anyway I thought I made up the rule before then but regardless um, we couldn't think of one except for Peter thinking of games that were you know outside the designated time frame um, however we did get a comment uh, from uh, Bill Vaughan, uh, ex in gamers staffer, uh, who reminded us of Duke Nukem 3D, quite embarrassingly. Oh my god, I can't believe, <laughs> I can't honestly, seriously believe that you didn't think of that. The pair of you, you pair are a bunch of yep. numb pieces. Did you think of us then? No, you didn't. I wasn't a part of this conversation, but if I had at least three minutes to think about it. <laughs> so there you go. Congrats to Bill for, uh, for, for, <laughs> stating the obvious, frankly, that we should <laughs> that we should have managed. Um, yeah. And your prizes, your prizes are mentioned on this podcast. <laughs> your prizes, yeah. It's, uh, you, you get congratulated on the podcast, and the next time I see you, I'll buy you a drink or uh, give you a biscuit or something. Just not <laughs> you're a biscuit, biscuit. So not a dog or something, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> a biscuit. I like biscuits. <laughs> Oh, don't like Tim, Tim, don't try to dig yourself out of that hole. Enough. Biscuit oh, Gates will continue <laughs> next week on the Gamers Podcast. Until then, goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.